Welcome to Red Sky Fuel for Thought, the podcast from Red Connect that interviews leaders in industry to bring you the latest insights, brightest thinking, and emerging trends in communications. So first up is our Trends Brief segment. This is where we take a closer look at emerging reports, research, or insights, elevating the key takeaways and bringing them to the table for discussion. This month, our own Richard Clark welcomes Kenny Yap, GM of Social and PR from the Red Agency in Singapore. Hi, Kenny, how are you? Hi, Richard, I'm good, how are you? I am doing very well, thank you. Thank you so much for joining me on the latest episode of Red Sky Feel Thought. Thank you for having me, a pleasure. No, no problem. So Kenny, for listeners sake, everyone, Kenny is uh, joining me from uh, Singapore where he is the general manager for PR and social. He runs a team of around 40 consultants and works on a, a wide range of clients be that government organizations like the Ministry of Manpower, right through to Domino's Pizza. So a real a real broad mix of, of, of clients there. So Kenny, the, the, the first question I have for you um, is actually around, uh, well, it's sort of just to sort of understand a bit more about the situation in Singapore and, and looking sort of specifically at the economy. So it's, it's widely reported uh, that the Singapore, uh, the economy in Singapore is a real sort of shining star of Asia. Recent reports have sort of looked at how the, you know, there's been, there's a record slump um, in light of the pandemic, which is obviously a very familiar scenario around the world. Um, so where's the country at now and just in terms of getting the economy going again? Yeah, I, I think we've been very thankful uh, in Singapore uh, the government has done an uh, amazing job in this uh, pandemic. Mm-hmm. Uh, to date, they have you know supported the economy with over hundred billion dollars over five budget announcements this year. They just announced an additional eight billion worth of measures to extend the job support scheme uh, announced mm-hmm. earlier this week. And the amazing part is that you know the the hundred over billion dollars have actually been drawn from the reserves, uh, not incurring uh, additional loans uh, uh-huh. from uh, different areas, uh, which is really an amazing thing. Uh, I, I guess emphasizing what we call saving for a rainy day. Uh, yeah, yeah <laughs> for example. Yeah. Uh, but that said, you know, it's still really challenging times for the businesses and the market in Singapore. Uh, it, it, we we have I think we haven't really felt the full impact because of the government support, be it for the various sectors, uh, for the rental overheads, or even with the job support scheme uh, mm-hmm. for the locals uh, and the workers and the workforce. Uh, but we we see that you know it's always a fine balance between opening up the economy uh, while having the 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 safety measures and interest in place. Uh, for the people, and we, I think, uh, at, at large, you know, the government has kind of controlled the numbers, uh, yeah. cases. Uh, we see uh, the FMB uh, sectors opening up. Uh, gatherings are kept at five packs uh, mm-hmm. a group. Mm-hmm. Um, all services are allowed to resume, short of the nightlife entertainment business, uh, understandably so. Uh, local tourist attractions are opening up. Yeah, but the aviation and uh, hospitality uh, sectors will continue to be affected. But in Singapore, it's very different, and yeah. we are very reliant on uh, external uh, tourism or in mass inbound tourism. Yeah, yeah. So you know, I, I think that's where we see a big challenge for a lot of the local businesses. Yeah. Uh, the government has you know, supported with budgets, but businesses need to transform and adapt to a new post-COVID world. Yeah. Uh, this is something that you know the government has provided that support uh, for all businesses to kind of ride into that new world. Um, yeah, and it's really, really vital and important to do so. Yeah, really, really interesting to hear as well because we've. We sort of on the first uh, the first edition of, of this podcast, uh, James Wright, our, our global CEO, was talking about how you know brands uh, really you know 
innovation is key here in terms of navigating uh, the pandemic. I'm sort of, I'm wondering if there is a, a sector in particular, um, you know, that's really kind of impressed you just in terms of how they've pivoted or how they've communicated, yeah. you know, to sort of just just to navigate their way through what you know what is you know ultimately you know very unprecedented times yeah in fact i'm actually like really impressed with all the sectors that have accelerated their digital transformation yeah. it's really amazing when you look at it where these companies have struggled for years and years uh, to convince whether internal stakeholders or just putting that whole transformation plan into life yeah. And they've actually managed to accomplish this in the six to eight months that we've been into 2020 because of COVID. Yeah. So, you know, it's, it's, what's amazing is that it, it, it could have something that has taken years with lots of pushbacks have actually been able to be accomplished in this couple of months. Yeah. But, but what's more interesting to me is that the, the pandemic has actually provided lots of opportunities for a lot of sectors, depending on how you see it. So taking, for example, the event sector. Now, the mm -hmm. event sector is one of the biggest badly hit sector uh, where you're constrained by the number of people currently. Uh, or companies are not having events uh, where you used to have lots of trade uh, seminars and stuff. Uh, but the other, the, the other side of things is where, you know, in, in the past, you were constrained by the size of the venue. But now, because everyone is getting used to uh, a kind of digital format of an event, you're, you're actually no longer constrained by the parameters of a venue location. Well, you can probably go 10 times more with an audience. So uh, during the pandemic, one of the, the I, I guess you would say, one of the most famous uh, Korean band, uh, BTS, they actually hosted their virtual concert to celebrate the seventh anniversary of their debut. And they picked with 756,000 viewers for a paid virtual concert. Now that's mm -hmm. almost close to 800,000, 1 million viewers. And you would have never uh, gotten a, a venue with that kind of size. Yeah. So I, I see that, you know, th there's lots of opportunities here and there, uh, where just taking that events as an example, or even for the f &B outlets, where they were struggling with rental space overheads, which were high. They're now able to operate from a centralized kitchen where you know, food delivery is a key component. Uh, most of the locals are kind of like dining at home mm -hmm. or rather preferring to eat at home. So you know, you're able to um, go onto this level playing field that I would call it and really change your business or adapt accordingly. Uh, to prove uh, to to forge ahead, yeah. so I, I would say like the, you know the the companies that have really uh, adopted well adapted well to this digital transformation has really impressed me the most, and those that can really see uh, that opportunity to leverage uh, and to really adapt, they would really shine. Shine, yeah, yeah. Because I've sort of. Um... Just you know, in in London in particular, the, the well, it's sort of well, brands and sectors for for me, it's, it's sort of it's actually been the small businesses that have really impressed me as well. Just in terms of, you know, you've had coffee shops that basically pivoted to become grocery stores overnight, and that yeah. sort of thing. And also, and somehow managed to also create a, a you know a sort of an online um, shopping experience and delivery service as well, literally overnight. Yeah, so yeah. It's interesting to see, hasn't it? Agree, agree, totally agree on that. Yeah. And is there, um, I mean, you know, looking back over, well, just looking back at 2020 uh, so far, you know, knowing that so much has happened, um, and it's been obviously been, it's been incredibly interesting, uh, complex time for, for, you know, for those that, well, just for, for everyone, but also, you know, if you look at the sector, the, the, the communication sector that, that, that we exist in, um, an operator. And is there a sort of, has there been a standout campaign for you? Um, just, you know, from a brand perspective, be that in Singapore specifically, or even looking a bit wider, at, you know, Southeast Asia or, or, or APAC, has there been a, a real standout one for you? Yeah. 
I think, you know, back to back to your earlier point about the small and local businesses. Yeah. I think I agree with you. They have really been really at the forefront. You know, despite their businesses suffering, they have really created food donation movements for the yeah. underprivileged, for the healthcare workers. Yeah. Uh, during this work from home, uh, uh, remote learning kind of uh, a season, you know, not not all families have actually the right kind of tools to facilitate that learning experience. And there are a lot of uh, Singaporeans, volunteers that have crowdsourced and donated laptops uh, or even for like internet connection with mm -hmm. dongles for the underprivileged. So you see a lot of like local movements going on where you really see that true spirit of togetherness coming true. But if you were to ask me from a brand kind of campaign, I think the one that resonated the most with me uh, would be Nike. You know, it, I, I, I'm, I'm sure you have come across that where they say, if you ever dream of playing for millions around the world, now is your chance to oh, play yeah, inside, yeah. play for the world. I mean, that, uh, that really, you know, sends the chills down the spine. It really hits it uh, with that copy. And it really ties into, you know, how they're able to adapt their service, uh, mm -hmm. where they make their Nike club training app complimentary, mm -hmm. Uh, you know, really putting out something meaningful for the, the communities. And so I think, you know, that really, to me, was one of the most, like, uh, outstanding kind of campaigns. Yeah. Yeah. So that, that's, a, that's definitely, that is a good one. <laughs> <laughs> okay, then. And then going back to sort of what you were talking about um, a few moments ago, just in terms of sectors that have really impressed you and you know looking at digital transformation or you know and looking at events and how the role of you know a virtual event has helped you know keep sectors going i'm just wondering just from a comms perspective and sort of knowing it, you know it sounds like they're just as is the case um around the world that there are you know certain sectors that are either open or are starting to open, or that there remains, you know, there's sort of there are restrictions around it. So, from just from a comms perspective, how do you think? Um, how can brands and sectors reignite demand? So you know, I, I think apart from uh, revenge buying, which we saw take place in China, yeah, uh, uh, pretty soon where you know the lockdowns were lifted and stuff. Uh, I think brands have to rethink certain areas like what is that code of convenience and safety for customers at large you know it uh, i i think that's a big paradigm shift uh, mm -hmm. and the, the code of convenience could mean uh, very differently for the different stakeholders uh, different audiences so brands would have to shift that approach you know accordingly um, but you know in, at havas we have this global havas meaningful study and we mm -hmm. know a lot about uh, what meaningful brands mean and matter to the audiences. And from the study, we know that a lot of the younger generation uh, uh, stakeholders are observing how brands are acting, especially during this COVID period. Yeah. Uh, observing whether brands are delivering meaningful impact through their business, uh, helping communities. Uh, and we know that these audiences are seeking brands that are meaningful in their approach and are looking to support them thereafter. Yeah. So we, I, I think for, for brands and sectors, it's always easy to look into sales as a, a predominantly kind of like a bottom line output. Mm -hmm. But I think that we, we've seen an increase of focus on what is meaningful and the, cu the customers or the stakeholders are really looking at how brands are really acting uh, during this COVID and moving forward. Yeah, it's sort of, there's never been, there's never ever been quite such a captive audience for brands, has there, other than yes. now? And, <laughs> and you know, I, I mean, we, we always, uh, there's always this challenge nowadays. Do you yeah. spend on branding versus a performance marketing kind of ROI kind of campaign? Yeah. And in today's climate, there's, there's no better time to invest and reinforce those branding elements where you know sales shouldn't take center stage while it's important yeah but if possible really build on that brand element and when and when we resume back into that new norm 
your stakeholders are there and I think that brand longevity and value would really increase yeah. significantly. Yeah. Wise words there, I think. <laughs> yeah. So let's end on a positive. Yeah. Um, just so from a, from, from a comms perspective, uh, is there anything that you're actually really keen to ensure, you know, stays as a result of this pandemic? You know, we know good can always come out of bad. So is there anything that you're really keen, you know, that, uh, that to ensure it, it continues? Yeah. So I think the role of comms to me has really stood a test of time and evidently has become even more important during a crisis especially the narrative and the manner is delivered. So whether it's external or internal comms, to me, the fundamentals don't change. And I believe they will continue to be the pillars of comms. So what I have is this acronym of uh, what I call ACEIT, A-C-E-I-T. You know, the mm -hmm. pillars of comms should be authentic. They should be clear. They should be empathetic informational or inspirational and should be transparent and i think you know with you know with how airbnb's uh, ceo brian chesky uh mm -hmm. dealt with the layoffs it was a, a a real accolade of like how you know some of the toughest message uh can be actually really delivered in a way that people could feel for it and could take it as positive as it could be. And, and the letter really addressed the employees with an empathetic tone. It showed, mm -hmm. showcased the passion for the company, for the people. It gave a very detailed background to the financials of the company. It described how it came to the decision to make these reductions. And so to mm -hmm. me, you know, it really shows that the role of comms, I believe strongly, uh, would stay uh, to be a very integral part of any business uh, mm -hmm. beyond the numbers. Um, and I, I, I think like that to me is one key area that will probably uh, never change in terms of the fundamentals. Well, Kenny, uh, thank you so much for uh, thank you so much for the chat. That was a really interesting. Um, that was a really sort of you know interesting conversation around uh, sort of situation in Singapore uh, and looking sort of you know more broadly at, at Asia. So at the end of this podcast and each episode going forward, we will spotlight one person from our industry or network to understand a bit more about what makes them tick. This interview is our red questionnaire. The guest is never the same, but the questions always are. My partner, Georgina Thompson, will be your host for this segment. Say hi, Georgina. So let's kick this first one off with Cherise Vilchez, Business Director of Red Havas Philippines and Havas Media Ortega. Cherise is a public relations professional with more than 12 years of experience, catering to a wide range of brands from consumer goods to travel, to tech and even corporate accounts. She's always passionate about meeting people and knowing their stories. Welcome, Cherise. It's brilliant to speak with you. Thank you, Georgina. Thanks for having me here. <laughs> of course. Thank you for agreeing to uh, to chat with us today. We're really excited to have you. Um, should we kick off uh, with our first questions? Let's give it a shot. <laughs> Perfect. So, Cherise, what was your first job? I actually started working when I was only 19 and I was still studying in college. So I took a part-time job at a local photo studio for kids and babies. And I was like a front desk officer. I was a front desk officer, but my role was quite unique. So I had to do the cashier. I had to um, assist during the shoots, like most important, like to make the kids and the baby smile and laugh. So, I, and then afterwards I would prepare the slideshow with basic Photoshop and then try to sell the photos to the parents. So I was a part-timer for two years. And then when they found out that I was about to graduate college, that's when they offered a new position, which is actually a marketing officer slash recruitment and executive assistant to the managing director slash um, many other things. <laughs> so I said, <laughs> yes, because marketing, was, marketing and PR was something that I was very, very interested in. So, but then the executive assistant part was the, was when I felt like life became more colorful. I felt like I was Emily from Devil Wears Prada. But, you know, 
I didn't have to wear designer clothes every day. So having that experience in retail and operations was a great training ground though. So because of that, um, I, well, my course was advertising and public relations and I realized that I got to meet a lot of interesting clients in the store. So all walks of life, um, they weren't afraid to open up to me and share their stories. And then it was since I was there for two years, I literally saw some babies grow up right in front of me. And that's when it hit me that I do love um, storytelling and I do love it when people um, connect with you and just open up to you. And then there's really something about photographs and how they, they also tell a story. So after my stint there, that's when I joined a local peer agency and the rest is history. That's amazing. Thanks, Rose. It's so interesting to have um, such a different sort of entry into our industry. So are you an early riser or do you burn the midnight oil? If this, if this question was, was asked like six years ago, I would have answered midnight oil in a heartbeat. Like I could stay up till 3 a.m. and then go to work as early as 8 a.m. But now I'm an early riser. I think it comes with age since I'm already in my mid-30s. Like even here at work, um, I always make sure that I come in a few minutes earlier. I just want to get a good head start. <laughs> How many stamps do you have in your passport? I tried to look at all of my passports and then started counting, but I think it's like around 20. But it's only because it's possible to visit Asian countries for the weekend, like you know, um, Hong Kong, Taiwan, Bangkok, Malaysia. It's very popular here in the Philippines. So some of us would, would, would fly there like once every quarter just to have a quick escape. <laughs> Um, I think it's the same as Europe. I mean, you guys also have that opportunity to, to go to Paris for the weekend or to Spain. So there, I would have to say like Taiwan is like one of my favorite destinations. Like I try to make it a point to go there at least once a year because it's really underrated. But the farthest that I've been to is probably New York or Turkey. There's still a lot of places that they want to go to when this pandemic is over, like Morocco, Portugal, um, South Korea. And I, I really do miss our islands. I really want to revisit our beaches like Palawan or Siargao. Amazing. Sharice, what's your favorite social media to follow and why? This is so hard to answer since I'm usually on Instagram like a lot. Like it's, 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 my, it's my safe space. So I guess it comes with a job that I do follow a lot of local and international media outlets and media personalities. Like in the Philippines, I do follow Mirza Sison. She's the first um, editor of Cosmopolitan Philippines. And, you know, she's really she's someone that I really look up to. And then I guess in the, the international scene, I follow Ariana Huff from the Huffington Post. And then there's some um, outlets like The Cut, Atlantic, New York Times. So it's a good source. Um, and I love their opinion um, pieces too. So, but even before Instagram started, I would always visit the blog of Scott Schumann, the, the sartorialist. So until now, I still follow him and his wife. And then as a huge fan of storytelling, I really, really love Humans of New York. It's funny because they're now also on, on Instagram and their stories are like really long and you really have to read it. <laughs> and then I also follow Moth Stories. And since you know, photography is something that I'm very, very passionate about also. And, and I do believe that I'm a visual person. I love accidentally Wes Anderson and Malika Fav. So like her designs are just amazing. I still dream of going to one of her exhibits in, in Europe and hopefully I get to bring home a piece um, back home. <laughs> so there, but on a personal level, like um, I am a huge fan of Korean dramas and Korean pop culture. So I do follow a lot of those um, Korean actors and actresses, even if I don't understand their captions. And then, yeah, I, I'm not, I'm not um, shy to admit that I am an army. So I also follow BTS. <laughs> I love that so much. I, um, I, I like the, the sort of selection that you have there. And I'm also a massive fan of humans of New York too. So I completely <laughs> agree with you. Yeah. So, Sharice, the headline grabbing your attention at the moment, if we read up on anything this month, what do you think it should be and why? I really think the one that I hold close to my heart right now, I guess, would be good governance in the time of the pandemic. So a friend tweeted this at the start of the, of the you know, pandemic. Um, he was saying, like, um, COVID exposed our government and its incompetence. People run for office thinking it's an easy way to make a quick book while gaining power. Then a crisis like this hits and suddenly it's a real job and they don't know anything about leadership and management. 
So here in Manila, we're on our six months of lockdown. And on a personal level, I can't help but feel a bit envious that our neighboring Asian countries are doing a lot better than us. So they are progressing and starting to open up. And during the early days, our local government was just too focused on other things rather than the pandemic. So, of course, being in this industry, I was a bit upset. Like, the government was focused on shutting down the biggest network in the country. They were convicting Maria Ressa from Rappler, which is one of the top journalists in the country. They were trying to pass an anti-terror bill, which may strip off, you know, regular citizens their freedom of speech. So in a global scale, I think it's great that we're reading about countries who are successful in fighting COVID um, without without a vaccine. So let's let's also put the spotlight on the nations who are currently still in bad shape. Like I know, I mean, aside from the Philippines, I, I, I know I've been reading also like there's still some um, other countries like uh, South Africa or South America and I guess the U.S. also like hopefully this can be an eye opener for the officers in charge, like the president, prime minister, ministry of health, for them to step up and be accountable. I think it's really important that we need to talk about it. Like we need people to know about it so that we can learn from each other and so that we can become better citizens or leaders. Because it's, it's you know, 2020 is really a game changer for not only for one person, but for, for everyone. The whole, the entire world is involved with this. And was there another topic that you wanted to talk to as well? Well, well, and the, if you want something like a bit lighter, like something more fun. So something that um, I find really interesting is that it's all about like East meets West. So for the longest time, especially here in the Philippines, we look up to Western culture, um, especially in the trend. So the Americans actually had a great influence in our country. And most of us in the metro can speak and write in English. It's actually a pri- primary language um, rather than Filipino. So the couple of for the for the past couple of years, we're noticing that the East culture is getting more and more popular. Like anime communities um, are getting bigger here. Like Gagan, an Indian chef based in Thailand, made it to the top five chefs in the world. Parasite winning best picture in the Oscars. And then I see more Filipinos enjoying Thai films and series. And then of course, again, being a fangirl, um, you know, BTS dominating the world in the music industry. So it, it, it's it's quite interesting that language is no longer a barrier and then more and more people are starting to open to be open to cross cultures like for the longest time people have been talking about diversity and representation finally um we can see it now in pop culture that it's more present so from here i think like since people are talking about these trends people can it can be applied from people's home and then people are more open at work and even in our different communities so, Absolutely, and I think that that's so um, that's so right, and I think that's one of the objectives of our um, of our podcast as well, because this is becoming so so important um, that we all sort of are working together across the globe. And I think um, you're absolutely right on this particular point, um, and it, it, it's really exciting. I think. Yeah, like you know, like we're just one phone call away. <laughs> exactly, a team yeah. chat away. <laughs> yeah. So cliches are cliches for a reason. What's your favorite? So it's what goes around comes around or as you sow, so shall you reap. So I do believe in karma, like whatever you put up, put out there in the universe, it will go back to you. Like sometimes we don't get the result we want immediately, but after a few years, you'll be surprised that it goes back to you. Like life has a funny way of surprising you. So like um, there, there were some instances in my life, like I, for example, like I did, I did this project and then you know you, ne- you never hear you try to help a friend and then afterwards you didn't hear from him or from her and then after five years your paths will cross again and then you for some weird reason he or she will return the favor and then you'll just be blown away by it like okay so there is no deadline for these things so I really believe in that <laughs> what's your message of encouragement and enlightenment I love this question I guess with their situation right now i know that a lot of people is yearning for things to go back to normal like i see posts like i want things to go back to normal i I want how it was before well here's the good news and the bad news things are not going to go back to normal so here's a quote from murakami like one of one of my favorite authors also that uh that i wanted to share so he says and once the storm is over you won't remember how you made it through how you managed to survive when you come out of the storm, you won't be the same person who walked in. That's what the storm's all about. So 
with this pandemic, you won't be, after this is all over, you won't be the same person you are anymore. But that's a good thing. So there is a better version of ourselves waiting when this is all over. We are given now um, the chance to reinvent ourselves and to, and to take good care of ourselves. So our inner chef, Baker, came out. Like, you know, I never thought that I would find myself in the kitchen. Our alter ego of being a fitness guru is on the loose. And even being an online seller in a span of two months is actually possible. So there is growth in darkness. This is all temporary. I know it's been more than six months, but I do believe that something good will come out of this, either in a personal level or even at a national level, and maybe in a worldwide level. I love that the quote that you um that you just read out because you know it's uh, um you know even speaking with some of our colleagues and some of our friends you know everyone has sort of gone through something together so it's around you know um so all coming together at the at the finish line and I think that you know we've still got a bit of a storm to weather don't we so we all have to kind of band together to get through yeah but I think yeah I think that at the end of this all like there's cliche another cliche there is a life by the end of the tunnel so and this is just it's it's gonna end soon I know it will absolutely so thank you so much Sharice for joining us um it's been an absolute pleasure to have you on um the red questionnaire and to learn some more about you and thank you so much for um for spending the time with us today okay thank you so much Georgina for having me over we appreciate you tuning in for today's episode We hope you'll join us again for more of the latest communications, insights, and trends from the team at Red Connect. Until next time, thank you.